Okay, um, let's see. So what we're going to talk about today is internal flow. So we spent um, kind of a lot of time now talking about external flow and um, trying to get some physical feel for convection, including things like you know how boundary layers grow, how turbulent flow behaves, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, and we did that in the context of an external flow. And an external flow I've shown here, an external flow is, is just defined as a flow where the, um, where the boundary layer here grows and uh, it never stops growing. So basically there's nothing around this surface that would cause this boundary layer to stop growing. So um, hopefully at this point we have at least a little bit of a physical feel for, for how these kind of flows behave. Um, we said, you know, this boundary layer grows, at least uh, for as long as it's laminar, it grows like the square root of x, because it's a diffusion process. At some point, it becomes turbulent, and turbulent, and things change a little bit. Um, while it's growing, the shear stress drops, right, because the velocity gradient goes from being very large to, um, to lower. So the shear stress drops. And, and you know, this is kind of a mental image that hopefully you have in your mind. Um, all of these... Um, you know, physical concepts and, and this understanding that we've hopefully gained over the last few lectures, we can transition over to, um, to an internal flow, right? So an internal flow is one, let's see if I can move forward, where um, the difference is that the boundary layer can't keep growing forever. Right, so let me find my pointer here. So for an external flow, the boundary layer could grow and grow and grow. There was nothing around the surface to cause it to stop growing. For an internal flow, what happens is the boundary layer can grow for a while, but eventually it gets, uh, it gets contained or bounded, right? It, it, it has to stop growing. And the reason it stops growing is typically because it hits another boundary layer that's growing from a surface that's in the vicinity, right? And at that point, then, these boundary layers are stuck. They, they can't grow any farther. Their, their size is, is stuck at being something like, you know, half the distance between these two surfaces. And, of course, you encounter this most often in, in uh, something like a duct or a tube, right, where you're flowing through a tube. You know, at the bottom of the tube, you get a boundary layer that grows, and it, and it stops growing when it hits the boundary layer growing from the top of the tube. And then, you know, you're stuck as you move downstream from there. So these are very important flows. These internal flows are very important in the sense that, you know, we're, we're always designing heat exchangers and thermal devices that use tubes to, to do our uh, transportation of the fluid and, and, and to, to do the, the heat transfer and so forth. Um, you know, based on what we understand about external flows, as long as this boundary layer is growing, we know that the shear stress should stop, should uh, should drop, right? So you know if you just sort of take that one step further, if the boundary layer stops growing and it's stuck, then I would expect that the shear stress stops dropping, right? And that is exactly what you get in an internal flow. You get a region where the shear stress is really high here at the leading edge, right here at the at the inlet to the duct, and then it drops as you move into the duct. And then as soon as you hit this point where these two boundary layers come together, these momentum boundary layers, you, you hit this point where the, the shear stress stops dropping and you have a constant shear stress for an internal flow. So that's you know, one pretty significant difference between an external flow and an internal flow is you go um, through, through only one sort of region in an external flow, right? It's always, the boundary layer is always growing. For an internal flow, there's two regions that are important, right? This initial region where the boundary layer is growing, that looks a lot like an external flow. We call that the developing region. If we're talking about momentum boundary layers, we call it the hydrodynamically developing region. But then at some point we hit this position within the duct, which we call the uh, hydrodynamic entry length, right? X of FDH, that's the hydrodynamic entry length. And if you go beyond the hydrodynamic entry length, then you're in this second region where you have what's called fully developed flow. And fully developed is just a way of saying that the, the boundary layers aren't growing anymore. They're caught, right? And, and the, the behavior of the flow changes at that point, right? You go from the developing region where things are changing to the fully developed region where some things at least stop changing, right? And that's, that's the difference between these two flows. So we'll, 
Um, like I said, try to understand a lot of the behavior of these internal flows by falling back on things that we've already learned uh, in the context of external flows and seeing that, you know, if you just sort of take those concepts and apply them to this kind of a situation, you already have the understanding to, to learn uh, what's going on here. So let's think a little bit about what the velocity distribution looks like for an internal flow. All right, so um, here at the inlet to the duct, I think it's pretty easy. Right, you've got a uniform velocity. Um, you know, at, at this inlet, it's all at what we would used to call the free stream velocity. Right, so u infinity. And then we can start to think about, okay, what, what does this velocity distribution look like if we're in the developing region? What does it look like when we just become fully developed? And then what does it look like as we move downstream and are in the fully developed region? Right? So let's start with the first one. What does it look like if we're in the developing region here? So um, in the developing region, the first thing we know is that uh, the, the momentum boundary layer has not penetrated all the way to the center of the duct, right? That's what makes this developing versus fully developed. So we do have a velocity gradient that extends not all the way across the duct, but only across this momentum boundary layer thickness, right? And then the same thing up here. And then in this core region in the center here, we have a uniform velocity, right? And then if we go a little bit farther down the stream and we get to this point here where we've become fully developed, now I would expect the velocity distribution to extend all the way across the duct, right? The momentum boundary layer has finally made it to the center, so I get this velocity gradient that extends all the way to the center, right? This is where the, the boundary layer just meets. And I want you to look at one thing that's a little bit interesting here, and that is that here the free stream velocity, this uniform velocity that's, that's entering the duct at the inlet, you know, is let's say one meter per second. But if I start moving into the duct, this velocity at the center, even though it's still uniform, it can't stay at one meter per second anymore because that would not satisfy continuity, right? I am, as I'm moving into the duct, I'm slowing down this fluid at the edge, right? And the only way that I can do that and satisfy continuity is if I accelerate, if I speed up this fluid in the center, right? So that's what's going on here in the, in the developing region is you have this situation where you're slowing down the fluid at the edge and speeding up the fluid in the center, right? And you can see that here, slowing this down, but this got a little bigger. And then here at the, at the point where it becomes fully developed, you know, you've slowed down the fluid out here, but you've really sped up the fluid in the center, right? The velocity here might be a factor of two bigger than the velocity of here, right? So that's what's going on here. If I continue to move downstream now, assuming the area doesn't change and the properties are constant, I wouldn't expect the velocity distribution to change at all, right? I'd expect to have this velocity distribution that stays uh, exactly the same now as I continue to move downstream, right? So that's kind of the picture to have uh, in your mind. And that is a subtle difference between an external flow and an internal flow, right? In an external flow, the free stream velocity out here would stay exactly the same, right? But in an internal flow, the free stream velocity actually has to increase a little bit in order to make up for the fact that you've slowed down the fluid um, here at the edge. <clears throat> All right, so we need to define a few terms that we will use for internal flow, right? So um, the first term is the velocity that we're going to use as our reference velocity. So in an external flow, we had the free stream velocity, right? The free stream velocity was the velocity that I could always get to anywhere on the surface if I just went far enough out from the surface to get out into the free stream. For an internal flow, as I start to change the, the, the area of these pipes or, or do all kinds of crazy things that I might want to do as I move through my machine, you know, th what the free stream velocity was way out here at the inlet matters less and less, right? And so what we want is a, a characteristic velocity that actually is the important velocity no matter where I'm at inside of this tube, right? And that's called the um, bulk or the mean velocity. So the bulk or the mean velocity is the single velocity that I can use to represent how much mass flow rate is being carried by this flow. So the bulk velocity is just the mass flow rate divided by the density times the cross-sectional area. 
So if you think about what this bulk velocity is, this is the velocity that you would be given if you were doing a problem, right? If you had a pipe and, and, and somebody said, you know, water is flowing through that pipe at three meters per second. Well, I mean, we know now that if you look at what actually is going on inside of that pipe, water is not flowing through that pipe at a uniform velocity of three meters per second. Water is flowing through that pipe at everything from close to zero meters per second at the wall to a, a value greater than three meters per second at the center. So what does the three meters per second mean? <coughs> well, the three meters per second <coughs> is the bulk velocity. So the three meters per second is the single velocity that you can use to calculate what the mass flow rate is. Right? So if I take that three meters per second and I multiply it by the area, I get the volumetric flow rate. And by the area here, I mean the area you see if you're looking down the pipe. And if I multiply that volumetric flow rate by the density, I get the mass flow rate. Right? So the, the way to think about the bulk velocity is it is the single velocity you could use in a mass balance. Right? If I cut across the pipe right here, three meters per second would tell me how much flow is crossing this boundary. Right? For a, a situation like this, where the density doesn't change and the cross-sectional area doesn't change, continuity would tell me that if I cut across the pipe here or here, or here or anywhere, I should have the same bulk velocity, right? Whatever bulk velocity is entering here, none of it gets stored here, so it's got to leave here, it's got to leave here, it's got to leave here. So the bulk velocity for all these different velocity distributions, it must be the same, right? So the bulk velocity here is actually just equal to the free stream velocity entering for this particular situation, right? So all these velocity distributions look different but they're all characterized by the same bulk velocity. And again, the bulk velocity is just the, the velocity you get by integrating the flow across the surface of the pipe. All right, so that's our characteristic velocity, right? We're gonna use the bulk velocity to define things like the Reynolds number, and later on the friction factor, right? For an internal flow, it's always gonna be the bulk velocity. Um, our characteristic length, for an internal flow can be a little confusing. So one mistake people make with an internal flow is they use the length of the pipe as the characteristic length. And the length of the pipe is not the characteristic length that defines how the flow is behaving. The characteristic length is more about the, the cross section of the pipe. And we characterize that cross section with a hydraulic diameter, right? So here's the definition of the hydraulic diameter. It's four times the cross-sectional area divided by the perimeter, right? So again, you have to imagine yourself looking down the pipe in the direction that the flow is going, right? And there's some um, area associated with that pipe that's filled up with fluid, right? If it's a round pipe, it's easy. It's just a circle. The hydraulic diameter is defined as four times the area of the pipe divided by the perimeter that's wet, right? So here for, for a round pipe, if I plugged in uh, the area in the perimeter of a circle, I'd get four times the area is four times pi d squared over four. The perimeter is pi d. I get just the diameter. It'd be a little weird if the hydraulic diameter of a round pipe wasn't the diameter, right? So that makes sense. But if, if you have a, a pipe or a duct that has some other cross section, right? So here's a duct that's, um, that's rectangular, right? A, uh, by B in terms of if I'm looking in the direction the, the flow is going, that's the that's the, the cross section. Well, I can still calculate a hydraulic diameter even though it's not round, right? The hydraulic diameter is four times the area, which is A times B, divided by the perimeter. The perimeter is, you know, this wetted length that goes around the pipe. It's two times A plus B, right? So that's the hydraulic diameter of, of this shape. And obviously any shape you want to think about will have a hydraulic diameter and you ought to be able to calculate it based on geometry. So we have a characteristic velocity, we have a characteristic length, now we can calculate a Reynolds number that's appropriate for an internal flow, right? So for any flow we said that the Reynolds number is going to be equal to um, some characteristic length times the characteristic velocity times the density of the fluid divided by the viscosity of the fluid. For an internal flow, the characteristic length is the hydraulic diameter. The characteristic velocity is the mean velocity. So this is the Reynolds number that I'm going to calculate uh, for an internal flow.